are not just the storybook versions. We have winners, we have losers, we have oppressed people, uh, we committed almost genocide in some cases, there were murders, there was civil war. It is not a clean, little, pretty story. So if you think of the great Hollywood masterpiece, Gone with the Wind, telling a complicated story of relationships between people, good, bad, the bloody part of the war, the nasty part, but also the wonderful ideas, the wonderful freedoms that came out of it, our Constitution of 1778 disestablished the Church of England as our official church, that the sheriff could come get you and put you in jail for not paying taxes to support. Now that doesn't sound very American, but it took us a little while to figure that out. It took us a little while to figure out that representative government was the way to go, that we didn't need a dictator. So, mission, discover, celebrate, share, commemorate our victory in the American Revolution, discover, celebrate, share, communicate the birth of our nation, the birth stories of South Carolina, and, and to tell our own citizens, to teach our own citizens a story. Because it's hard for us to get serious about it if everybody else doesn't know the same thing we do. The General Assembly, in their wisdom, gave us some partners, Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, who already spends millions of dollars a year on promoting South Carolina as a place to come and spend money. Cultural heritage tourism is a great economic engine. I want you to know that when my daughter graduated from college, she had gotten herself a full ride. So I told her she'd go anywhere in the world she wanted to go. She wanted to go to Egypt. So we went to Egypt. I didn't want to go there because it's, it's pretty unstable times. Egypt doesn't have any oil. The number one driver of that country's economy is tourism. Their story is magnificent. I got to tell you, it's magnificent. <laughs> But our story here, we don't have any pyramids, we don't have any um, you know, great uh, river and Nile stories and tombs of Ramses and all that kind of stuff. But what we have is authentic sites, the real thing where people can come and really walk where their ancestors, their patriots, um, people who fought, go to places where people died and have experiences that are real. Not Disneyland, they're not as pretty as that in all cases, but they are real and they are here. South Carolina is blessed with that. The second thing that we're blessed with, besides those authentic places, is that we have wonderful heroes and wonderful goats here. And to tell a good story, you need a good hero like Francis Marion, and you need a good anti-hero like Tabby. Old Cabington, he's a blend of two or three different characters, but the real characters are even more interesting than the Hollywood characters. And so we have those people here. Additionally, in this vague legislation, uh, we were charged with telling the stories from the African American point of view, which is absolutely proper. But our commission wanted to be even more inclusive, is the modern term. And we wanted to tell the story from everybody's point of view. What happened to those loyalists? Where did they go? What happened to all the people in South Carolina who were neutral, who didn't care, who wanted not to be involved until somebody ran into their farm with a, a gun and pointed it at them or a sharp blade and pointed it at them and say, hey, I need your pigs. And you know, they got they got with the program pretty pretty quick. And thirdly, how did it impact the Native Americans and the African Americans free and enslaved. And we gotta tell all that because that's the truth, number one. And if you don't hear all of the story, you don't really know all the story. I was pretty fascinated when I first started studying certain battles. One of the most important battles in South Carolina is the Battle of Calvin's. And for Calpins to happen, there are pre two precursor battles that we needed to win, we being the Americans. 
Number one is the Battle of Black Spots Plantation, a great tall soccer battle. Number two is the Battle of Hammond's Store. So I want to read up on Hammond's Store. In every book I looked at, they talk about the hero William Washington. They talk about the South Carolina militia under uh, James McCall very much. None of them told us anything about who was there. So we went there, according to the books, to fight an unknown, no commander group of people that we just needed to beat up on. And I said, well, it does not make any sense. Who are these people? Where did they come from? What were they doing in Lawrence County, South Carolina? And why did it matter whether we beat them or not? Now that's a story for a different time and a different lecture. But I just thought it might be a good idea for us to figure that out. And that was before I met Durant. I was just asking. But, um, and, and be able to tell the story. So we have a lot of fundamental research that we've done. But we have a lot more to do. Because we've got to tell all these stories. And, and make them make sense. And weave them into the fabric of this Revolutionary War experience. So, identifying battlefields. Not only do we have to know where the battlefields are, some of them we want to invite our tourist friends to come. Now, I got, I'm going to take a huge risk here, George. I, people who know me love, I love to talk about millennials and Yankees. And I don't really mean too much about it. But if we can have Yankees come down here and spend money in our local economy, to see battlefields and learn something about our story to people from Europe. And no offense to the Yankees in the room. I know there's some of you, I know some of you. It's a good thing for South Carolina. We need the money, and thankfully, the American Revolution is spread all over the state. It's not all in Charleston. And by the way, Charleston much, doesn't much need our help. So I'm not against Charleston, but I'm for sending people here to Clarendon County. I think it's a good idea for people to see where the battlefields are, where Francis Marion walked and fought here in Clarendon. And I can tell you, Clarendon's ahead of a lot of other places because of the murals. So you know, you know, the murals are a great thing, but I want them to drive by the building with Terracote Swamp on it and then go to Terracote swamp and see the actual place and why they're here. I'd like for them to eat in the restaurants, put heads on beds, go shopping in the stores, and contribute to the economic betterment of the interior of the back country of South Carolina. So, this is just happens to be a map I was working on a little bit. That's not all the sites, because those are just battles. And we're not talking about just battlefields here. We're talking about our heroes and our goats. And so where Francis Marion was born and lived and died and buried, all those are important. But guess what? There are people who were just as important on the other side. There were political figures like William Bull, for instance. William Bull was a royal lieutenant governor and acting governor of South Carolina. His house was very close to where the ruins of Sheldon Church are now, a beautiful sight. But we've got to tell William Bull's story. We've got to tell the story of Thomas Fletcher, the leader of really the Loyalist militia in South Carolina, Robert Cunningham, of people like that, even a scandal. We have a scandal. Robert Cunningham wasn't a scandal. He was elected by his peers in 1778 to sit in the South Carolina Senate. He did become a general of the Loyalist militia later, but his, just a relative, I guess, Bloody Bill Cunningham was a homicidal maniac, I think. And um, that's Charles Baxter's amateur diagnosis, but he was a murdering, killing guy. So he is worse than real Tarleton, worse than real James Weems, worse than James Dunlap, Bloody Bill Cunningham. So we gotta tell that story. And by the way, people will come to South Carolina just to hear about it. Now, I didn't know that until I met David Ruhr. And David, in, in addition to being a, a, a Revolutionary War scholar in the South, is in love with the Lincoln assassination. And there are people who come from all over the world 
to follow the Lincoln assassination trail. And if we could, and, and I can't imagine why anybody would want to do that, other than it's kind of interesting. I think that we can sell the Bloody Bill Cunningham trail. I think we can sell the James Weems destruction from King's Tree up both sides of the Black River, burning out 50 plantations and ending up at Fish Dam Ford with a list in his pocket when he gets wounded and captured by Thomas Sumner. So, how do you tell South Carolinians? That is probably the hardest thing. Getting a battlefield, building a, building a pull off, ordering some signs, planting signs, training some good interpreters is pretty easy. Educating South Carolinians about their own stories, their own lineage, lineages, their own heritage, what happened in their own backyards is going to be the real challenge. And I think that our commission will partner with some other extremely well-established groups like the Daughters of the American Revolution, who are way, way ahead of us on figuring out how to best educate people about our stories and what difference it makes to the world. So, we've got to tell them about women, children, Native American, African Americans, loyalists, and South Carolina's revolutionary era. So, yes, it is fun to talk about Marion and Sumter and Pickens and William Moultrie and Governor Rutledge and all those folks, but we've got to talk about everybody else, too. So, hopefully, we'll be forming some local committees because I am not going to go anywhere and tell people what they ought to do. There's enough of that in the government. What I want to do is hear what people who know the local areas, who know the local sites like George and Carol, tell us how they want to interpret the stories, and then I want to help them do that. I want Manning, I want Manning, South Carolina, to be a center because you are a center of activity in the American Revolution. And we've gotten a little bit of start, you know, talking the Fish and Wildlife Service into using their Indian mound is not easy, but, you know, they're, they're talking. And so hopefully our partner, Doug Bostic, at the Battleground Trust and David Brewer will be able to make some good ha headway there. We still have some sites that we know the names of, but don't know exactly where they are. And so that means library research, looking at things like Johnson's traditions and remembrances, like Drew did, and doing some real high quality archeology span to, so we can say this is the actual spot. This is where this happened. And this is where this happened in 1780 and 81. So I was thrilled at Drew's presentation. Drew, all right. It, it was wonderful. And it's amazing. It is amazing. And I can say that about all the people. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to short you, JD, because you're an amazing guy, too. The buttons and the musket balls and the cannonballs all have a story. And if you get with someone knowledgeable about buttons and cannonballs and uh, especially lead, there are stories written in that. And it's a wonderful teaching tool and you can teach our kids about it because that's something that they can touch and feel and see. And in the case of Wadhu, in the case of Monk's Corner, it helps tie them directly to people who walk there from the 18th century. Now Drew showed you a bunch of different British units. All of them had important roles in South Carolina, like the 7th Regiment March, the Tarleton up to Calpins and got smited there. <coughs> How that 31st button got in there, I have no idea. That'd be, that'd be a good one for somebody. <coughs> Locate a button, learn its story, make it publicly accessible, and let folks know how to see and hear the story. So one button can be what starts the discussion. <coughs> now, everybody can participate in this. And you get to choose, you don't need anybody to tell you. Find an ancestor, find somebody you're interested in, 
find the grave, find the site, find the house, find a corner, find a place in the woods. Give that place a voice. Just give it a voice. Just be the spokesman. Be the person who can stand up and say, this is why this private soldier, who changed sides three times, by the way, this is what motivated him to act. This is what we know about him. This is what his contribution on both sides were. And if you go deep into these family records, and I am not a genealogist, you will find many people, a few actually claim pensions from both sides, many people switch sides once or twice, and I can tell you this, if somebody has a sword to your neck, that is a powerful recruiting tool. I think I would sign up on either side who had that. Or if you're sitting six months in a rotting, rat-filled, disease-written prison hole in the river, in Charleston, and somebody comes and says, you can go to the islands, and you don't have to fight your neighbors, just fight down there in Jamaica or somewhere. That's not, that's pretty appealing, isn't it? Pretty appealing. So, tell a story, figure a story, jump on a research project that you like, and join your local people and make yourself a committee of 99 to tell, to discover, and figure out how to make your local sites visitable.